a question to all of you. Why are you trying to scare British voters? Nigel. I'm not. I want to inspire them. I want to tell them that this country, for a thousand years, ran itself rather successfully and rather well. And whilst I love Europe, I want to trade with Europe, cooperate with Europe, be friends with our neighbours, I think we can do a damn sight better making our own laws in our own parliament, controlling our own borders, and reaching out to the rest of the world. I don't want to scare anybody. I want to inspire you that we're better than being a star on somebody else's flag. OK, so... <laughs> Alan, Nigel says he's being positive. Why Project Fear? Well, Nigel's positive about everything... Uh, uh, pessimistic about everything until it comes to Britain leaving Europe. And then he turns into Anne of Green Gables and says everything will be, will be fabulous and wonderful. We live in an increasingly dependent world. I think I'm the only one old enough, sadly, to have voted in 1975. I voted yes, and I'm pleased I did. And I think in the ensuing 41 years, Europe has not only been important for our prosperity and our security, but it's helped to ensure that countries that were under totalitarian rule in the East and under military dictatorship in the south of Europe have gone from oligarchy to democracy. I think that's far more important and inspiring than anything that I've heard Nigel or you kids All right, say. you're all inspiring us tonight, but come on, Nick. There's been, <laughs> there's been plenty of warnings about job losses, about the economy. You're not scaring Me. people? Oh, sorry, right. Um, no, I, it's not a question of fear, but... Um, I think it's legitimate to be concerned about what this means, not just for us and for those of us here, but for our kids and for future generations. Because this is one of those unusual votes, general election votes, other you know, democratic contests. They can go one way and then go the other way next. This is a decision which will cast a very long shadow, one way or the other, for you know, the people who don't have a vote for next generation. When I think of my kids, I've got 14-year-old, 11-year-old, 7-year-old, I think to myself, if, this is obviously what I believe, if we pull out of the European Union, we will, I think, almost certainly then see the United Kingdom fall, fall apart. So it's not just one union, it's two unions that are at stake. I think we'll be less relevant in the world. We'll be sort of drifting friendlessly somewhere south of Greenland. And, and then what? And it's just not the kind of country I want my kids to grow up in. It's as simple as that. Uh, another, another man who divides opinion. Let's hear from a woman, Andrea. Thanks, Anushka. The EU has changed beyond all recognition. It used to be a free trade area. Now it's trying to take over everything. This is the single opportunity. It's the best chance we have to make it on our own. This is a brilliant country, the fifth biggest economy in the world. We have so much creativity. We speak English. We're in the time zones between North America and Asia. We have absolutely every opportunity to make the best of it if we go alone. We've got to stop letting the EU rule things. We've got to take control, save lots of money, and do our own thing. All right, thank you all very much. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to keep my eye on those hecklers out there. You're going to have to pipe down, I've been told. Um, right, can we take a question from the audience? We've got Lionel Derry. Where's Lionel? There you go. Specifically, procedurally and economically, if Britain leaves the EU, what would happen? And if we don't know the answer to that, I, I don't know how anybody can, can vote for a, a Brexit. But specifically, what, what is going to happen if Britain leaves? Well, Andrea, maybe you could go first. Your prime minister, your party leader, says that we could enter a period of uncertainty. Do you agree with him? Well, I think the point is that if we decide to leave the EU, we will then be in a position to negotiate the terms that we want. Let's face it, the EU exports more to the UK than we do to the EU. It's in all of our interests for friendly cooperation. That's what's going to happen. Nobody has a crystal ball. I don't, do you? And so the point is, we will have to negotiate the terms of trade, but those terms of trade will be there. And the key issue is we will be back in the driving seat, able to determine the terms of trade, not not just with the EU, but with the rest of the world. But what happens in that period? Well, 
very specifically, there's at least two years before any of the treaties are disapplied, and that's assuming that you straight away on day two invoke Article 50 of the Treaty of Rome, which you don't have to do. When Greenland left the EU, they did not do that. It didn't even Greenland. exist when they Alan? left the EU. So it's perfectly possible <laughs> All right. to negotiate a terms of exit with continuity and then the, the potential of leaving. Alan doesn't agree. What are you saying? I think that means we spend time and treasure trying to get back to the very good trade deals we've got at the moment. Negotiating trade deals with 53 different countries, trying to retain what we've already got by our trade deal with the biggest commercial market in the world, bigger than China, bigger than the US. At the same time, we've got to deal with the question of immigration. People think we would be better in terms of, for people who are obsessed with immigration, we'd be better. We'd lose the protection of the Dublin Accord. We would lose, in all probability, that deal we've got with France at our most vulnerable point. And I believe that most of the exit groups, there's different versions of them, and there's a, a multitude of different leave groups, a large majority of them want free movement anyway. So those thinking they're going to get rid of free movement, if it's Norway, that is their example, we still have free movement. If it's Switzerland, we still have free movement. If it's any kind of trade deal that means anything with the rest of the European Union, it still means well, free movement. Well, let's put that to Nigel. It's well. still free movement, Nigel. <laughs> um, Alan, uh, you can speak for your side of the debate. Please do not attempt to speak for our side of the debate. There is nobody... <laughs> Which side? There is nobody is the supporting sides? Brexit that does not want this country to return to sanity, which means border controls and an Australian-style point system to decide who God. comes to Britain. We don't want <laughs> unconditional free movement of people. Now, Lionel asked the question, what will happen legally, procedurally, um, after this referendum? If we vote to remain, I can't answer the question because I have absolutely no idea just how much legislation is in the pipeline um, and, we'll, and we'll come on to uh, British businesses, uh, will affect our ability to be competitive. I can tell you uh, that within a few years, if we vote to remain, we're voting to go into a political union with Turkey, 77 million even poorer people, uh, which won't just mean even less control over our borders and even more people coming, but our borders going to Iraq, Iran and Syria, raising some very, very big questions. OK, there's some now, heckling. Now, Nigel, now ask, Nigel, Nick wants to now, cut in there. If we vote to leave, if we vote to leave, we go. Uh, what will happen? We'll invoke, as Angela said, Article 50 of the treaty and enter into a, a negotiation period that will last up to two years. I very much hope it'll be shorter than that. But the absolute key point here is this. What we're doing if we vote to leave is we're voting to become an independent, self-governing nation that makes its own laws, does its own deals, and charts its own course. And already tonight, you've seen Alan talking about the impossibility of doing deals, um, and Nick basically implying that we'd be some piddling little island just south of Greenland. The other side think we must be part of this European Union because they don't think we're good enough to All govern right. our own country Thank you very and to much. make our own laws. And I do. Nigel. I do. As much as I do love you to carry on, remember who's the boss here, Nick. No, no, when, when, Lionel, is it? When, when Lionel asked the question, I thought we were finally going to hear from Nigel and Andrea which... So it's no, no point just saying two years and negotiations. What specifically, that was the question, what specifically happens at the end of that negotiation? But what a, what a country? So, well, hang on, but what? So, sometimes economy. I hear people who want to leave the European Union say, we'll be like Norway. No, you don't. Some no, say you don't. Iceland. No, you don't. Well, hang on, no, let me finish the list. Let me finish you the don't. list. Oh, no, Some say don't. Switzerland. Some say Andorra. No, no, uh, Boris Johnson says Canada, and Andrea's just said Greenland. No, now, no, no. Of, I, you just said I, Greenland. I, I so Greenland was the only one that. Say we are like let, Greenland. Let me let Don't me finish. Put words let me in finish. My mouth, Nick. The point is about all of those countries, all of those countries that are outside of the European Union that try to trade into the European Union. 
all of them, without exception, have considerably worse terms of trade with our European neighbours than we do by being part of, let's remember, what is the world's largest marketplace. And Andrea no, just, made, just repeated one of the great myths in this debate, that we export more to them than they do to us. This is simply not true. 50% of what we export goes to the European Union. No. Their total exports from the rest of the European Union to us is about 10% of their total exports. Okay. So who has the whip Nick, hand? Who has I'm the whip no. hand? No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, this no is, Nigel, I'm Andrea's going to come back in here. I'm going to ask Andrea to respond on this point. What Nick is saying there is that the trade deals that exist with other countries that are not part of a customs union are inferior. A lot of people talk about Canada. There are tariffs on a lot of goods. How do you respond to that? Well, for Which a start, one? it's a load of nonsense that it's Iceland or Norway. Iceland Which has 300,000 population. Switzerland has 8 million population. Those are small countries you compared to the UK. We are the fifth largest economy <laughs> in the world. We, of course, can survive on our own two feet. How many free trade agreements has the EU managed to negotiate? A pitiful number. They haven't even managed to negotiate one with the United States. The UK, on its own, would be far more able to negotiate for free trade in the services area, which is what matters so much to our economy. In the EU, intra-EU trade in services is absolutely abysmal. It's all about goods and that's not where our economy is forgive, strongest forgive me, can, can, and a free trade agreement will be perfectly possible you, and you know it. Well, okay, I, I, one sec. I, I'm gonna, can I, one fact, can I, no, just one I small mean, factual. That big and then yeah. I'm going to bring in Georgia from the audience. No, just, just one factual observation. A, a long time ago, before I went into politics, uh, those halcyon untroubled days. I, uh, I worked as an EU trade negotiator, yeah. for instance, helping, yeah. helping, yeah. helping, yeah. helping, yeah. I was a small cog in a bigger wheel, but helping to try yes, and, and settle the terms of China's accession to the World Trade Organization and Russia's accession into the World Trade Organization. I remember sitting as part of that negotiating team on the other side of the table of a, a, a line of pretty flinty-faced Chinese trade negotiators. They listened to what we had to say because we represented no. 500 million people. Do you seriously think we can strike yes. a better trade no. deal You're with a superpower like yes. China Definitely. representing yes. 60 million yes. as opposed to 500 million? Yes. It Actually, makes Nick. no sense. Yes, no, Nick, we do. Hold that point. Nick, We're going to we bring in Georgia. No. I'm sorry. We Why? are going to bring I'm in Georgia sorry. from the audience. I'm sorry. Georgia, no, Nick, where no, are no, you? No, I can't let that go. No. I know it's Come past on, Georgia. the pantomime season. You need season, to cut in on Nigel. But, oh no, you don't. Nick, <laughs> it's, you talked about doing a trade like deal with China. Iceland has a population of a third of a million. Georgia They've done a trade deal with China. A and the European one. Union hasn't managed to do it. If right. Iceland's one. big enough, we're big Thank enough. Thank you very a very much. bad deal. Where's Georgia? There you are. Okay, let's hear from Georgia. What will the European Union be in 10 years' time if we stay in or leave? Thank you very much. Let's start with you, Alan. Well, whatever it is, we'd have had a say in what it is. And the argument that Nigel just used about Turkey, Turkey can only uh, come into the European Union if there is a unanimous decision by the members of the <laughs> European Union. We have a veto over countries that might join. We are an influential country. Are you Britain, seriously saying that Britain's position now is to block Turkey's accession? I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying that we have a say in it. I'm saying that if we're outside the European Union, we're still affected by what happens at our, on our continent, including what's happening just across the channel in France. We have a say in what happens in Europe over the next 10 years. And I reject this argument that Europe is always something that's done to us. Yeah. That where the is. Britain is the six stone weakling on the beach, having sand kicked in our face by these <laughs> bullying continentals, it is a ridiculous parody of how Europe operates. So I want to see us in Europe, I want to see us effective in Europe, I want to see us influential in Europe, as we have been for 41 years. Okay. Uh, Nigel, yeah. is what you're saying a ridiculous parody? And where will you, the EU be? Oh, in 10 we're years? influential in Europe, all right. We're very influential. In fact, since 2010, and for most of that time, Nick here was the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, since 2010, there have been 40 occasions on which, at the Council of Ministers, we have said this piece of legislation is against the interests of the United Kingdom, and we please ask you to change this law, and you know what? We've lost on 40 That's occasions. Rubbish. That's, That's how influential rubbish. we are yeah, as rubbish. members of the European yeah. Union. Now, 
It's just rubbish. I, it's rubbish. I, I, you know, nobody can tell exactly in 10 years' time where anything will be. I would just say this, that whatever the ideas were post-war of getting France and Germany together to reconcile after the disasters that had happened, that all made sense. Breaking down trade barriers made sense. The more people trade with each other, the friendlier they are with each other. But the project now has completely outlived its purpose. It now looks 40 years out of date. It has a currency that has brought poverty to tens of millions in the Mediterranean. It has a migrant crisis. It, 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 it has dealt so badly with the migrant crisis that it's stoking up all sorts of massive social problems. And right across Europe, we see people now not wanting the project as it is. If we stay on board this, in 10 years' time, we will stay part of a failing political project. If we leave, not only will we be better off, but I hope we'll inspire the rest of Europe to change the whole thing and get back to a club of friends who are sovereign nations okay. that trade together. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I'd like to bring Andrea into this, but also let me just tell you, Andrea, what we've just had from Kate Brax on Twitter. Does anyone consider the little guys in this? Many farmers in the UK survive on EU subsidies, a whole industry <laughs> down the pan. Mm. Mm. Well, that You're a rural MP? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of farmers in my constituency. And what I can say about that is net we send £9 billion a year to the EU. Gross, it's £19 billion. And the remainder that we get back in subsidies are things we have to apply for, things we have to beg for, things we have to co-finance, pet projects of the EU. So farmers, yes, they are supplicants, asking <coughs> for roughly 50% back of the money that they paid over in the first place. So my answer to that is on voting to leave the EU, the United Kingdom government will absolutely continue in the short term to provide those subsidies whilst we think about what makes sense. And some of the things that would make sense would be um, environmental trading credits, because at the moment you have farmers who have to do a bit of um, environmental planning and a bit of farming just to meet the EU requirements. It would make so much more sense if those with the big fields do the sheep and those with the hill farms do the butterflies. That would make a lot more sense for the UK, and it's perfectly possible, but only okay. if we leave the EU and sort it out for okay. ourselves. We're talking about the longer yeah. future, yeah. and I'm going to just throw another one in there for you, Nick, if you could just <laughs> wait. We're talking about the longer future from Georgia. We've also heard about Turkey a few times. One question that we had from Ms. Montoya was this. When the EU was originally formed, we were a group of countries with similar norms, socially, culturally, morally, and judicially. As more entrants have joined, can we still say that all members have the same values or cultural norms? And how can we continue to say that we are part of a like-minded community with the imminent entry of Turkey, a country with a terrible human rights record and a dynamic growth population set to reach over 100 million? In 10 years, are Turkey part of the EU? I, I doubt it, and I don't think there's no imminent entry of uh, Turkey. But the point about that question is, actually, the, I think one of the unusual uh, successes of the European Union. It has encompassed very different countries, yes, with different histories, economies, societies, cultures, and so on, uh, in a sense sharing one particular economic space, but doing doing things differently. You know, we haven't become any less British since 1973. We're not part of Schengen. We're not part of the Eurozone. It isn't a straitjacket. It's a much more flexible arrangement than I think the question implies. But can I just very quickly, to the person who asked, what, in 10 years' time, look, my guess is three big things will have changed. Firstly, the European Union clearly and particularly the rest of the European Union, the countries in the borderless Schengen area, will have to, and I hope rapidly, sort out the external border controls of Schengen. Because it made no sense to have a borderless arrangement where you've got no internal borders or external borders. So I think that's one thing that will have to happen, and I hope fast. Secondly, just because of the threat of cross-border crime, cross-border terrorism, we have a Brit who's the head of, the Euro of Europol. A lot of the things that we do in Europe help keep us safe. The European arrest warrant allowed us to extradite Hussein Osman, one of the, who you know, was then uh, uh, convicted here in the United Kingdom, one of the people who tried to blow people up in London on the 21st of July 2005. I think that cooperation to keep our streets safe will deepen. And I think the Eurozone, which is clearly still in quite a sort of shaky state, will need to, uh, will need to sort itself out, particularly by making sure that the stronger countries, Germany and so on, help out the weaker countries so you don't have these great imbalances. As for the UK, here's the only 
Final observation I want to make. I hope we will be, in 10 years' time, a leading member of the European Union. Not cowering on the side, not sort of, you know, sort of trying to pull up the drawbridge and, and wish the rest of the world away, but actually leading in our own neck of the woods. But if we were to leave, here's the great thing which Nigel and Andrea never admit. They rant and rail about these rules. We would still have to abide by those rules if we wanted to continue to trade in the European Union. The difference is, like Norway and Switzerland, we would have to abide by the rules, but we couldn't write the rules. What's the control and power in that? Okay, um, Andrea, pick up that point. But while you're there, let me just throw in another one from Twitter. See. P can I, can I just answer answer that? One second, let me just throw this in for you. Can you name one <laughs> specific agree. EU regulation that you consider to be harmful to the UK and why? Okay, can I answer this, mm -hmm. this question first? Because I think it's really important to bear in mind that we will, as the UK, in the end, have 12% of the voting in the European Union. 12%. As Nigel says, we failed to ever persuade them, just using persuasion, to do anything for us. In That's fact, wrong. over the last 20 years, That's we've tried wrong. 70 times and failed 70 times to get legislation changed so that it meets the UK's interests. So the only vetoes we will have in the EU will be defence, so going to war, a bit of tax, and then accession of new member states. We won't be a member of Schengen and we won't be a member of the Euro. And what we we have to bear in mind is that those two things alone, the migration issues and the Eurozone issues, require that the EU move to political union. That's where it's going. If you look at quotes from Angela Merkel, from President Hollande, from Juncker, from Tusk, they all say the same thing. The EU is headed towards political union. We simply can't stay a part of it. We have so, to do our own so thing. So, Andrea, you're not and convinced by the nonsense. Prime Minister's reforms then? I'm sorry? You're not convinced by the Prime Minister's well, reforms? Well, you know, I think, actually, the Prime Minister's reforms, he absolutely bust a gut. I mean, he looked exhausted, didn't he? He really tried very hard. He had the certainty... <laughs> he had the certainty of a referendum in the UK behind his reforms. And what was apparent is there is no appetite for reform. So he came back with something that's not enforceable, not legally binding, won't happen, and so reform is simply not possible. So actually, at every level, we have the opportunity, the sunlit uplands, Project Hope, every opportunity outside of the EU, and we should just take it. So, that so give us question. that one example. Give us that one example. Give us the one example. Andrew, I was a minister, Secretary of State in five different departments. I spent 11 years negotiating in Europe, and I don't recognise this picture of being overruled all the time. Give us oh, one are. piece of legislation that's been okay. imposed on us. Okay, one, one example from when I was Treasury Minister is the fact that the European Union did not want the Bank of England to be able to impose higher capital requirements on UK banks. The Bank of England wanted to do that because the UK banking system is enormous. It, their assets are five times UK GDP, so we wanted to reserve the right to have higher capital requirements for prudential reasons. The European Union didn't want us to do that because they wanted maximum harmonisation, so they felt it might give us somehow an unfair advantage. So that's clearly not in the UK interest, yet it was imposed upon us. But okay. No, one sec. No, no, no. We're going to okay. go to a question in a minute. Another one. Wow. I can carry on all night right. giving you one. examples. We've had, a, we've had an anonymous question from the audience, which is going to be kindly read out by our volunteer page. Can't hear you. Can't hear it. I think you're just talking into my ear. <laughs> All right. Switch it on. Not to worry. Should I? I'll do it. I'll do it for you. Um, how how okay. can the Labour Party claim to support the working class by voting to stay in when all evidence suggests that the uncontrolled immigration is suppressing wages, clogging up the NHS, creating a housing shortage, flooding the schools with more pupils than they can cope with, and finally give £20 yes. billion pounds per year it. into yeah, the question. EU instead of investing it here? Yeah. Right. Alan, I think this one's for you. <laughs> because I think so as well. Uh, because, uh, be, uh, because we're an internationalist party, because we believe in solidarity, because we believe that countries working together in our continent can resolve problems that we couldn't possibly resolve alone. On the question of immigration, there are issues, there are issues around uh, exploitation and about fairness. 
We'd like to resolve those issues. For instance, there is a social dimension to Europe. Protection, basic protection for workers that many of and many, I'm answering the question, that many of Andrea's uh, uh, compatriots, not Andrea herself perhaps, call red tape. That's protection with maternity leave, paternity leave, the are right you, for part-timers to get, you're asking why, why, work, why representatives of working people would not want to divide those working people in the xenophobic way that many of the opponents of the EU are trying to do. So, well, and, I'm sorry. I'm and sorry. furthermore, and furthermore, those issues can be resolved. They weren't on David Cameron's, uh, Cameron's agenda. There are trade unionists and socialist parties throughout Europe who want to stop the exploitation that some employers are, are yeah. using uh, uh, against Eastern Europeans that come to this country. We can do that through the European Union. All right. If we leave, we have no control One over sec. that, and I guarantee we would still have free movement okay. of labour. Okay, to Nick, to Nick on those points. First of all, do you really believe that women's rights like maternity leave would go if Britain was on its own? And secondly, do you agree with Lord Rose, the chair of Stronger in Britain campaign, that wages would go up if we had Brexit? Look, I, I obviously can't speak, speak as a socialist, um, um, but I would say this to whether you're from the left or the right or the centre or whatever. You're in the centre, aren't you, Nick? Well, no, if you, whatever. <laughs> I'm kind of in the middle, I think. Um, we're, no, no, whatever no, political no, persuasion no. you are, here's the thing. What, I think actually you've got to go right back to sort of fundamentals. What kind of world do you think we live in? And, what, and how do you think Britain or any British government from right, left or centre can play its role to keep people safe to get people in good jobs, to raise money through taxes to fund decent public services, to keep our air clean and the water that we drink clean as well. How do you do that for your own citizens? And my, well, this is the answer to the question. Just I'll make sure he answers the, the question. Hang on, don't worry. I know the suspense is killing you. Just let me answer the question. I just don't think any British government of whatever persuasion can do that for us, for British citizens, unless you work with other countries. Because you cannot, you cannot in an era of globalization sort out your economy unless you do it with others. You cannot keep your streets safe unless you work with others to beat cross-border crime. You cannot keep your environment I clean that, uh, unless you work with others. And Andrea. that's why I think it's not just if you're a socialist, so I'm pointing at you, but not if you're just from the left. Wherever you're from, working together keeps us safer and stronger and fairer for the future. Yeah. Well, I think I can uh, safely say that on this one, Andrea, you disagree with Nick? I mean, it just defies belief that we survived until 1970, doesn't it? Yeah, how on earth did we do that? Why did we grow after it? Well, we didn't, actually. Did we, we grew in line with global growth. We haven't grown particularly spectacularly. But can I just ask Alan this question? Who introduced shared parental leave? Something that's done so much for women in this country. Yeah. A, the coalition government, that my point yeah. is, I'm very I'm happy asking, yeah. for you to take credit for <laughs> it. Here we go again. But it wasn't. Here we go again. The point we is, did it. The Lib Dems did it. The point is, it was not the European Union. Yeah. What we're talking about here is not your personal achievements, Nick. It's what the European Union can do. And it was a British government that introduced that. It's the most ridiculous argument to say that somehow equal pay, aspiration, women's rights, um, the, the issues for parental childcare and so on, these are British issues. See, They're okay, not you me a European. Yeah, I'm asking you. Ask you are you answer. seriously saying Here's that we the answer. Them? Here's the answer. Which party was it that opted Britain out of the social chapter and all the benefits? And number two, which party had in their 2010 manifesto that they should reduce maternity leave? The first was the Conservatives, the second was UKIP. So, okay, so can I, on, can I, gonna... on that... Okay, very, on very that. quickly, Andrea, then I'll very, come to Nigel. Very, very yeah. quickly, uh, on, on the social chapter, in my constituency, in the run-up to the general election, Talking to an HGV driver who is subject to the Agency Workers Directive, an EU measure that says if you're employed by an agency, then after 12 weeks you're entitled to contractual rights the same as if you're a permanent member of staff. What he wanted to know is why it can possibly be allowed that he gets laid off every week 11 so he then can't provide for his family. And of course the answer is so that they can start the clock ticking again so they don't have to give him contractual rights. It's just ridiculous. Okay, well, it's an unintended consequence. Okay. But the UK right. on its own could solve it in a heartbeat. We can't as a part of the EU because they tell us what to do. OK, oh, I'm no. going to go over and to Nigel party, now. No, let me have a say on this. Which party was it, Alan? Which party was it 
that in 2004 opened up the door to eight and then ten poor former yes. communist countries and in doing so depressed the wages of working class people in this country. In fact, in many ways, the Labour Party, through its new love affair with the European Union, has betrayed the very working classes okay. it was yeah. supposed to represent. Let me, let me um, ask you a question, Nigel, that we've got here from Witness, Mal Pitt. If leave wins, do current EU migrants get temporary work visas during or after transition and then have to apply to stay under some sort of point system? Or do they automatically become some flavour of UK citizen? You've talked a lot about Bulgarians and Romanians, Nigel. Mm, yeah. If we have Brexit, do you kick them out? I was, well, of course, I did talk about Bulgaria and Romania, and I made some predictions for the numbers that would come, which, of course, were completely laughed at and denied uh, by Nick and the others, and it proved that actually what I'd said was an underestimate of the numbers that would come. Whatever mistakes we've made in the past, and we've made some very big mistakes, although I'm not sure we know the scale of those mistakes. I mean, we say that a million new migrants net have come from the European Union since 2010, but the problem is there have been 2.3 million national insurance numbers issued. So I, I begin to worry as to what the real numbers are. Whatever mistakes we've made, anybody that came to Britain legally is here legally, and we would not attempt in any way to change that. Thereafter, yes, you're right, we would expect people to apply for work permits, we would expect people not to qualify for benefits until they've been in the country for up to five years, paid their taxes and obeyed the law, and we'd stop discriminating against people from India and New Zealand who've got real skills to bring us, okay. who now find it very hard Alan, to get into Britain. Why are you... <laughs> Alan, are you discriminating against people from the Commonwealth in favour of Europeans? No, we're not. And incidentally, the only are. reason... Well, of course we are. Incidentally, the only reason why we haven't got a trade agreement with, uh, between the EU and India is, is because Britain keeps blocking it. And they're blocking it because it would mean more migration from India. Anyone who thinks no, that the no, people no, on the right... Alan, free who, free oh, just just a second, like Nigel. That. Anyone who thinks that the people on the right, like Nigel and his friends, want to come out of the European Union so they can let more Pakistanis and Indians come into the country <laughs> are living in a fantasy land. Yeah, okay, yeah. I want to bring in a you know, question. You know, Alan, Alan, right, you, on, you, you, clearly, you clearly know next to nothing about how trade deals work. Nowhere else, anywhere in the world, do trade deals <laughs> involve the free movement of people only inside the European well, Union, Nigel, and you're selling a complete myth Do you to accept these that the trade deals that do not have freedom of movement do have many more restrictions and many more tariffs? No. Free trade deals nowhere Name else in the one, world. Which nowhere is else in the world do free trade deals involve the free movement of people. No, but nowhere. can you name a free trade deal anywhere in the world yep. which doesn't have freedom of movement but does have the yeah. same trade rights that the customs union of the EU? Uh, many free trade deals involve a total abolition. Could you most name free one? Most free, well, most free trade deals. I mean, Switzerland, Switzerland well, has more free movement. trade deals than we do. And as I mentioned, Iceland has got a better deal with China no, than doesn't. we've got. Trade deals no, are doesn't. about sovereign states getting rid of barriers to trade. Never does it mean the free movement of people. Nick, just, I mean, Nigel, never. So, forgive me. You really are just. You really are now just making stuff up. Iceland's deal with. I'm sorry. Iceland's deal. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ice, Iceland's deal. Iceland's deal with China, mm. with the greatest respect to any Icelanders in the audience, is a rubbish deal. Oh. They have been completely <laughs> railroaded by the Chinese. We can measure up to the Chinese in negotiations with them precisely because we represent what remains the world's largest marketplace. Look, there is something called safety in numbers. There's something called strength in numbers. No. That's what you derive by doing stuff no, together rather than having this illusion that you can just wave a magic wand and tell the rest of the world to abide by our rules when we are just on our own. Isolate doesn't make you stronger. It simply doesn't in the modern world. Well, it means can it's I, more flexible. Can I, can, I, can I just address, if I may, Anusha, can I just address this underlying point that I think certainly was uh, explicit in what Andrea said earlier and is certainly implicit in what a lot of Nigel says, which is that we always get a bad deal in the European. They tell us what to do. We never ever, you know, however much we stamp our foot, we never get our way. I think if you're a political scientist from Mars, 
and you landed in Europe, and you asked yourself, what are the big things that have happened in Europe over the last 20 years or so? You'd probably single out two massive revolutionary changes. One, the creation of the single market. A British invention, first invented by a man called Lord Cofield, who was then a little known, and in my view, still an underappreciated British commissioner, and then enshrined in the Single European Act by a conservative government led by Margaret Thatcher at the time. That was the greatest sacrifice of sovereignty, but sensibly so, because it created this borderless single market. The second huge transformation, which I think, I remain of the view, was one of the most brave things things done by any generation of recent political leaders was after the collapse of the Berlin Wall to, to, to extend a hand of friendship and partnership okay. and embrace Central and Eastern Europe. That was a British achievement against okay. the objections of other Absolutely countries. Right. And you guys Thank complain you. that we don't get our um, own way. No, no, no. Wait, Nigel. I'm going to bring and in to a question. Fair, I'm going to bring in a question from... Up but above you forgot up. to mention the Euro, Nick. The Euro. What a wonderful what achievement the Euro has been that you wanted us to join but we're not 15 part of years Euro. ago. How about that? What a complete disaster that's been. All right. I've complained about this always being a bunch of blokes fighting it out, so let's bring Andrea into this debate. Can I ask you a question? Some of the people who are campaigning for out disagree about the best way to go about this. There is vote leave and there's leave.eu. Do you think Nigel's wrong to highlight immigration so much? I absolutely only focused on what is right for our country. And in my view, being the fifth biggest economy in the world, having the opportunity to do our own trade deals, still being very much a part of Europe with friendly negotiations, working together where we want to, but being on our own, free to deal with the rest of the world, that's really what interests me. So I think anybody who's interested in putting those arguments to the British people are people who are doing a good thing. So I'm not really interested in the kind of shenanigans. OK, <laughs> uh, let me bring in David Sevier, who I think is up there. Scotland has made it very clear that if Britain votes to leave the EU, it will seek to leave the United Kingdom so it can remain part of the EU. If the price of Britain leaving the EU is the dissolution of the United Kingdom, do you believe this is a price worth paying? OK. Um, Nigel, why don't you start with that? And yeah. Thank you. And well, let me is... just throw into the mix <coughs> Jeremy Clarkson's view of this, which is that if we leave... <laughs> I always agree with Jeremy. If yeah. we leave the EU, he suggests immigrants will simply come through Scotland. What complete, what complete and utter nonsense the Scottish debate is. Um, the first thing to say is that as this campaign goes on, already we see a narrowing whereby the levels of those that want to leave in Scotland are becoming increasingly not dissimilar to the levels of those that want to leave in England. That's point number one. But if Britain does vote for independence, and that's what this referendum is all about, the idea that the Scots would vote, well, oddly against independence, but would vote for separation and would say to the Scottish people, we can stand on our own two feet, when they based all their economic numbers two years ago on oil at $113 a barrel, when it's now trading at $35 a barrel, is frankly for the birds. All right, Alan. Uh, uh, it's all a load of nonsense, says, says Nigel. Well, I think... Um, it's highly likely that if Britain votes to leave Europe, then Scotland will vote to leave Britain. And we lose not just our place in Europe, we've not just damaged our continent, we've damaged ourselves and we've unraveled the Union. To be frank, if I was a Scot, and I'm for the Union, if I was a Scot and Scotland voted, and yes, it does depend on Scotland, Scotland voting heavily to remain, uh, and the rest of the country voting uh, to leave, and I hope that doesn't happen, but if I was in Scotland, I'd be thinking again as well. And I think we are running a very, very high risk here, not just for our place in Europe, but for Britain's continued uh, uh, continuation Alan, as well. You, you said you voted in 1975. As I understand it, Scotland then voted out. So what's changed in Scotland? When did they become such Brussels lovers? What's changed in the Labour Party as well? The Labour Party was divided. Mrs Thatcher, of course, the day when the result was announced, which was uh, a huge 66% in favour. She said she was highly delighted. She went around with her flags of all the nine European Union countries at the time. That was 75, incidentally, nine member states, no World Trade Organization and no Channel Tunnel. Now, a much more interdependent world, 28 member states, uh, 
uh, 41 years of membership we'd be wrenching ourselves away from, and Nigel and his colleagues seem to think there'll be so much goodwill in the rest of Europe that we'll get these brilliant trade deals that are just as good as the ones we've got now okay. before we wrench ourselves away. Andrea, you support the United Kingdom. Are you concerned about what might happen? No, I'm not, actually, because uh, the truth is the Scottish Nationalist Party just had their referendum. They voted 55-45 to remain, and so it's simply not credible that they would choose to have another vote and that the UK government would allow them to do it. So take, take a, an example of a, a poll recently in the West Midlands. The West Midlands are 80%, according to polls, in favour of leaving. So what are we going to end up where little regions have their own say on what their view is of the EU? It's just Scotland's a nonsense. A they voted to remain in the UK at a time when they knew a okay. referendum was on the cards. Let's put that to so Nick. Nick it's not credible it... that they're going to get another yeah. referendum. It's well, not I credible. Mean, with respect, the SNP have said they want to move towards another They've referendum. They've always, that's so the point they, of the SNP, If they Nick, say it, I suggest we should believe what they say for. rather than, no, than what they... any of us say here. Look, I think it not only would... Clearly weaken, well, it clearly weakens our place in Europe. It clearly weakens the bonds that hold the United Kingdom together. I, I also think it would significantly weaken our standing in the rest of the world. I mean, if you look at the all-important relationship with our friends in the United States, I mean, the, one of the reasons why the United States values the United Kingdom is precisely because not only we share language and culture and so on, but also because we can stand tall in our own European neck of the woods, which is important on our side of the Atlantic. If we suddenly are out of the European Union and the United Kingdom, worse still, has disintegrated, then of course we're going to be less relevant to the United States. And what I always find interesting about people who advocate Brexit, often, often, I'm not sure if that's the case for Nigel and Andrea, often they're the most ardent Atlanticists, but precisely leaving the European Union would be a bigger body blow against that great transatlantic relationship than almost anything else we could remotely do as a country. No, well, no. Okay. No, no. no. no I mean, we, we, we in the UK... In the UK, we're one of only four countries that are meeting the NATO requirement for 2%. The UK and the US do share a language. We share a great deal of history. It's just, it's just, not, it's just not plausible why the that we would saying, lose why any the Ameri ability. Why are the Americans then saying... That the we, Americans, they, Nick. Yes. A couple of Americans, yes. Well, there are couple, other uh, Americans uh, who President say Obama, that the UK President should leave Barack the Barack EU. Obama is a bit <laughs> more than a couple. Outgoing, no, he's an outgoing um, president. It's not Joe Bloggs in Cleveland. President. This is the president of the United States. And it is not, he doesn't have a vote. He, Nick, doesn't have a vote, does he? This is for the no, British. No, but he has a view okay, as the US president that it is best for the transatlantic okay, relationship. Thank you and, and very the much. Let me, States, do you want a quick one, Nigel? Collapsed. Quick. Just, just, just to say that Obama is the most anti British president America's ever had. And, and actually, actually, Nick, the big, the big bind between us and America is through NATO. Now, I'm not you know, fully in favour of all the wars that America's talked us into, um, but, but I have to say that actually the biggest threat to the Anglo-American relationship, the biggest threat to NATO, is the fact that in Brussels they are hell-bent on building a European army, navy and air force as quickly as they can. And when I raised this two years ago with Mr Clegg, he told me it was a dangerous fantasy it is now being proclaimed by everybody in Brussels. They have established a separate command structure. And I think that NATO and okay. our relationship with America is threatened by EU All right. The bigger danger is in. Putin. The bigger danger is Putin. The big, okay. much Juncker. bigger danger of this fantasy fear Mr. of the Mr. Juncker army says it every week, Vladimir Nick. Putin. Okay. What Stop does Vladimir lying. Putin want? One sec. Stop can... lying to people about this. You lied in 14 and you're lying again. They want a European army, and that's a fact. All right, Nigel, thank you very much. Down. I'm going to bring in Lee. Lee Sheldon in the audience, who's here. Good evening. Uh, I've got to be honest, I'm one of those people who is still undecided, believe it or not. And I think one of the challenges is getting facts. So I like to just zoom in on a couple of facts, if possible. One of the arguments that the Remain side make is that if we're outside the single market, we won't have any say on the rules that govern it. What examples, tangible examples, can you give me of how we've actually affected those rules, specifically about the single market? And perhaps if I could ask a question to the exit side, we all know, Nick said it, that if you are buying in bulk, you get a better deal. How can you assure me that we could do deals with China, India, whoever, with 60 million people and get a better deal than if we were supporting a deal of 500 million people? Okay. 
Alan? Uh, well, I think, as Nick said, the creation of the single market is very, is very important as a, uh, a British ideal carried out by a Conservative government. It was always a single market in trade and should also be a single market in services. 80% of our trade is in services rather than goods. And we have been instrumental in pushing uh, the services directive. And the Prime Minister's negotiations took that a little bit further. And I think that's a very big prize for us. The agreement that Andrea mentioned of the trade agreement with Canada doesn't include services in all its 1,400 pages, half of which are exemptions to free trade. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is about plastic duck manufacturer, you still need to abide by the colourant uh, directive if you are producing electrical appliances in Britain. Why have still we got need different plugs, and, Nick? What? Why have we got different plugs, then? Well, that's a very good point, but, uh, but <laughs> it shows the flexibility, the joyous flexibility of the European Union, that they don't harmonise everything. No, but here's the point. If you do, for instance, what Norway's done, right? So they are outside the European Union, but they quite understandably want to export effortlessly into the single market. Guess what they call it? They call it fax democracy, no, no. because the rules that you allude to are, are faxed to them from Brussels once we've made, made those rules, and then they literally have to transpose them, no questions asked, into domestic legislation. So oddly enough, Norway, often held up as the great paragon of greater independence and taking control of their own affairs, have catastrophically lost control and real sovereignty over their own affairs okay. because they're not at the table where those rules are being drafted. OK, there was another question. Andrea, Nigel. Andrea first. Well, I'm just in, in response to Nick, I just wonder how on earth the Chinese managed to buy a Jaguar Land Rover car. No, but they how don't. on earth, if the plugs don't match EU regulations and so on, are you seriously saying that the only advantage in trade in goods is if you've got some kind of but, EU but rules around that. But the point that Alan was that. saying, actually, we, we about, I think it's about 70% of our GDP is made up of services. Yes. We have a massive surplus, so we sell much more of our services, those architects, those lawyers, those advertising no, execs. No, we don't, Nick. Yes, we do. To no, the rest of the European because there are barriers put up no. to the internal marketing services. Well, yes, I tell you, are. a lot less than to Perhaps Chinese no, engineers true. or architects or advertising okay. execs. The whole point is that the international trade agreements we have with China is tariffs on goods only. It doesn't cover the most important important part of our economy. So and we shouldn't jeopardise services in the British economy, given how important they are. Well, so you'll, you'll agree then that it's a shame that in 40 years the EU hasn't achieved a free trade agreement with China, no doubt. But just coming on to how big is the EU, how important is it? In, back in the 1980s, it was 30% of global GDP. Now it's set to be around 17%. It's actually the third biggest regional um, block for trade, and the UK is the world's fifth biggest economy. So what you say about, you know, we can't survive on our own, we can't do deals, we'll be meaningless, it's kind of like a prisoner sitting hunched up in their cell, and the jailer's just opened the door, and the prisoner's scared to go out. To say that we've got nothing to offer without being a part of this incredibly controlling, okay. increasingly controlling block is just nonsense. Okay, Nigel. Yeah. Um, well, look, once again, uh, Nick is telling you a complete pack of lies about Norway and their deal, but he's good at that. He's done it for a living for years. <laughs> the, what I would say, I mean, we're being told, wouldn't it be dreadful to be like Norway? How ghastly. Can you imagine being rich and independent and happy? It's one of the most successful countries in the world, yes. but we have to knock them and, and berate them. I think what we need to understand... Okay. We've got to get to a fundamental yeah. point here. Why does the Norwegian Prime Minister quickly, say Nigel, we shouldn't I'm bringing do it? Career, career politicians who've never bought and sold a good or a service around the world in their lives are trying to tell you that it's governments through technical deals that make trade and business happen around the world. It is not. Trade is done by consumers looking at a product and trusting it and buying it. Okay. And actually, we're living in a modern, global okay. economy. I'm bringing and in a the question. Sooner, the sooner we free ourselves to recognise that whilst trade with Europe All is right. important, Thanks, Nigel. trade with the world and being free to make our own trade deals is even more important. OK, thank you very much. Can I'm going to bring in... No, I'm going to bring in can a I question. Just ask no, Nigel. No, no, no. No, can I just ask Nigel? No. If, why is it that the Norwegian Prime Minister... Why is it the Norwegian government have okay. said, Britain, you shouldn't follow our example? Why do you think Don't that is? Can I tell you why that is, Nick? Why is that? Shall I tell you why that is? Because just like you, and just like... Oh, they're lying as well, are they? In this country, so the Norwegians, the Norwegians lied, who voted no 
to the European All Union right. were betrayed Easy. by their own political Easy class tigers. and signed oh, up to the single it's market. It's all a betrayal. And it shows the danger of okay. trusting people right. like you. I'd like you to all stop. I thought, just before I bring in this question, you might like this comment from Kate McCann. Loving, punchy Nick Clegg being back on the scene. Hashtag confession. All right, <laughs> let's bring in a um, question from Andrew Priest, but it's going to be read by our volunteer, Joe, because Andrew didn't show himself at the desk. Go for it, Joe. Philip Hammond said in a speech, none of our allies want us to leave the EU. Not Australia, not New Zealand, not Canada, not the US. In fact, the only country, if the truth is told, that would like us to leave the EU is Russia. That should probably tell us all we need to know. My question is, is he right, and can we be more effective in opposing Putin outside the EU? Alan. No, we can't. Indeed, that's been one of, the, one of Europe's great, uh, I think, steps forward, that they were able to put meaningful sanctions against Russia over... Uh, Crimea uh, uh, in particular. And I think that has demonstrated uh, not just the European Union's commitment to freedom, democracy, free speech, which are very important principles. They've brought oligarchies to be democracies across our continent, and it's a contribution that we shouldn't uh, forget. And okay. I think the only politician that would be pleased, the only international politician who would be very pleased if Nigel and Andrew get their way is Vladimir Putin. So, Nigel, you're critical of Barack Obama. Would you rather align yourself with Putin? No, I don't want to align myself with anybody in the world. I want to be an independent country that governs itself, chooses its own foreign policy, and can I say there are lots of voices, lots of voices in business and through civic society right throughout the Commonwealth that would love Britain to be able to make trade deals with them, to cooperate more closely with them. The question about Putin, the question about threats... And how best do we deal with threats? Let me say this, and I'll say it again. The NATO alliance has proved a very effective means of governments to cooperate together to deal with providing deterrence against threats. What the European Union did by trying to say to the Ukrainians, we want to expand, we want you to become part of our union and you to become part of our military alliance, was to directly provoke the coup that got rid of an elected president of that country, and we have actually provoked this situation with Putin. I don't think that's very clever. Nick. I really don't. Nick. Well, it's the, it's the clean sweep now, isn't it, according to Nigel Farage. So, President Obama's anti-British, the Norwegian politicians have betrayed their people, everyone else lies, and now the European Union is responsible for, the, for Russia barging into Crimea. Yeah. It's <laughs> absurd. Yes, it's complete. What is this sort of absolutely. hysterical conspiracy theory? Absolutely. No, 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 absolutely, Nick, you're right. And it was, we, Andrea. We provoke Putin Talk about in the Ukraine windmills. unnecessarily Honestly, okay. and stupidly. Thanks, Andrea. You know, I think this is a really serious point. It's very easy for other countries to say, oh, you should just stick with the EU, because, of course, that's the devil they know. They've got no skin in the game. This is a very serious issue for the UK's own voters. It's impossible for other people, I think you mentioned Australia, Canada, in, in, in Philip Hammond's quote. I mean, how can they possibly know the problems that we have with the EU? The EU didn't used to be a problem. When it started out, it was great, exactly as Nick said. It set, it set up free trade. It was a good thing to be in. Since then, we've had ever-increasing centralization, bureaucracy, more political control. We've got the Schengen, we've got the Euro, and that is absolutely going in the wrong direction for the but UK's national interest. But Britain is outside interest. Schengen, Andrea. So it's really not for other allies. But Britain is outside Schengen and the Euro. Yes, oh, well, absolutely, but that's right. my point. All the right. fact that we're outside those, those things Things means that as the European <coughs> Union, who are inside, most, many of them are inside Euro and Schengen, they have to act in the interests okay. of their common external border and their common currency. And All that's right. where the real problem comes. Okay. The status Alan, quo in Alan the UK is simply not an option. Okay. I just want to ask you a question, Andrew. If Europe is always something that's done to us and we're outvoted every time, and it's been a terrible disaster for us. How come we're the fifth largest economy in the world and very successful when we well, spent 41 years Andrea? in the having 
things done to us by the Andrea, European Union. So, so the UK's economy has grown in line with the rest of the world. There hasn't been some massive dividend for being a member of the EU. So the British economy has grown because the British economy's own strength. So if you, if you look at the charts, over a very long period of time since we joined the EU, so nothing our to do with Europe. Is okay. in line our success is nothing to do with Europe economies. at all. Nothing well, to do with Europe so at all. So are you going to say then that Greece's economic success is also due to their membership no, of the EU? No, I, I'm Great gonna, job. No. I'm going to say that our trade okay. with Europe All has right. increased by a third to a Guys. half. And that's an important part of our All success. Right. I'd just like to tell you what Grant Stanley is saying here on Twitter. He thinks that, Andrea, you would make a very good Chancellor of the Exchequer, which has got me thinking about the Conservative Party. I think we might have to address that issue. Do and this is to all four of you. Nigel, there's a lot of blue-on-blue blue bashing going on here. Andrea herself has had to be critical of things the Prime Minister has said. Do you think their party can survive this? Well, I, I mean, I enjoyed Angela being critical of the Prime Minister. It was really rather fun. Um, I, I think the problem is that so many of the newspapers are framing this debate as a blue-on-blue blue debate, and that's probably a very big turn-off for two-thirds of the population who didn't vote blue in the general election. You know, to be a Eurosceptic is not to be right of centre. This question of whether we govern ourselves is not about left and right, as far as I'm concerned. It's about right or wrong. Um, and I hope, I hope this referendum, I hope it doesn't degenerate into a civil war in the Conservative Party and a battle for the succession. I fear it is heading in that direction. Well, Nigel um, is on my far left tonight, which is quite fun. But as he points out, you're far right. Um, Alan, the point Nigel makes is very interesting. Two thirds of the population who didn't work, um, vote Tory, are they being put off this? And actually, what are you doing to get Labour voters out? Because there are a lot of concerns that Labour isn't doing enough. Uh, well, it has been blue on blue, and I, uh, that's the one thing I agree with Nigel. I think it's tempting for you in the media, dare I say, to make a story when it's Boris speaking against Cameron. Or and Cameron cabinet speaking minister speaking against their prime minister. Yeah, I mean, that is a story. And, it's I, and it's been a story that's dominated the first three weeks. I don't think it would dominate the whole campaign. And in terms of what we're doing, it's about getting out to Labour voters, talking to them on the doorstep and making the arguments, which might not get the media coverage, but is very important come 23rd of June. All right. Um, Andrea, I was asking about blue on blue. Tell me, how is this affecting your party? So I just don't think there is blue on blue. I mean, you always get, you always get, uh, you always get some members of the party who will disagree with the party leadership. But, you know, for my own part, I genuinely say the Prime Minister has done a brilliant thing in allowing and, in fact, encouraging members of the party, even if they're ministers, as I am, to go with their heart. And I had a lunch with him just before this all kicked off where he literally said, do not be persuaded by anyone, not by me, not by your whip, not by your party, not by your constituents. Go with what your heart tells you. And that's very empowering. And for me, that is about the country would be better off outside of the European Union. So, I mean, obviously the media likes to sort of big up disagreements, but I think you'll find if you actually look at what people are saying, I have not criticised the Prime Minister and I don't criticise him. You might hear it that way, but it's absolutely clear that the party is doing this in the interest of what people genuinely believe is right for the country. All right, and um, talking about Tory bashing, Nick, you've been... At the receiving Bashed end of some Tories. of that, <laughs> uh, are you are you enjoying are you enjoying what you're seeing? No, I mean look, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's obviously a, it's been brewing for ages. I mean, it's like the sort of two sides of the conservative brain at war with each other, and it, it represents a very profound philosophical difference within the Conservative Party uh, between those who kind of accept the modern world as it is who believe that globalisation requires an internationalist response, and those who hanker after a sort of 19th century view of parliamentary sovereignty, sort of gunboat diplomacy, and they're, they're at war with each other. But, but I mean, look, there, there, there are not just divisions in the Conservative Party. Of course there are divisions. I mean, people feel very strongly about this. At the end of the day, people, I think, will vote with their hearts as much as with their heads. I think it's interesting that younger people tend to be much, much more positive about us remaining in the European Union. And I do think, and I do think by the way, if you're a, an uncle or a father or a mother or an aunt or a grandparent, you, you, you know, you, I do think we all need to kind of pause and okay. think what we decide will fall on their shoulders, on the youngsters' shoulders. And, and in a sense, we don't have a right to mess it up for them. We don't have a right to make okay. a bad decision so which I... messes it up for them. Andrea? Yeah. 
can I, can I just say, to coin a phrase, I agree with Nick. I think it's absolutely vital that we all look at this from the point of view of our children and our children's children. I mean, I'm a mum too. You sort of play the dad card quite a lot, Nick. Um, I have uh, <laughs> three kids myself who all firmly believe that the UK's best days lie ahead of us. And they are all absolutely comfortable and excited about the prospect of the UK leaving the EU. So I don't want you to sort of claim the moral high ground okay. for young people. What young people want is opportunities. Yeah. They want to travel the world. They want to have oh, the yeah, absolutely. They want, they want to travel. No, they don't. They but, want um, to travel the world. No, the world. Andrea, Andrea is how it many people go? Opinion? How many people take their gap year just in but Europe? Jesus, all right, but not not many. Andrea, just on that point, it is true, however, that if you look at the polls, young people are more likely to back in, older people are more likely to back out. Yeah. I mean... You're saying that, Anushka, I think we'll find out on June the 23rd. But what I would say is young people are looking for opportunity and freedom. There's a very interesting interview done with a Polish lawyer recently who came to this country and said actually she'd like Britain to vote for Brexit. Why? Because Britain now reminds her of totalitarian um, e Eastern Europe when actually everything was moving towards greater centralization greater bureaucracy. But Andrea, okay. and what, what we Andrea, need okay. is, Andrea, do you, is freedom do, do you at least to make accept, our own future. Do you at least accept that this issue about you know, the freedom to move around our hemisphere in Europe, it is a two-way street. There are almost as many Brits living, studying, working in Europe oh, as there are Europeans oh, coming no, here. No, All right. Right. Okay. Why, why, on that why point, we, Nick. Why would no, you no, deprive no. them of that freedom? Nigel, Nigel what happens to lying, Brits abroad? Nick? Can we please stop lying? Why do you do this? Why do you do this? What happens I mean, to the Brits in Spain, Nigel? You know, there are four million. There are four million EU citizens living in this, including my wife, living in this country <laughs> and living full time in the rest of Europe, excluding Ireland, fewer than three quarters of a million. Can we please at least argue on the basis of okay. the facts? Those are okay. wrong. Please. Those are wrong. You're wrong. Please. You're okay, wrong. Before, we, before we carry on, um, just. Alan, do you think your leadership is doing enough? And can I just also throw in there, how do people feel voters might feel about the monarch's views being aired in such a public way? Oh, well, Alan? you better ask Nick about that. He's uh, <laughs> been having some personal conversations. Uh, yes, my leader's doing enough. Uh, it, there's a video out there now. He's absolutely committed uh, to Britain remaining in the That's European Jeremy, Union. That's Jeremy, not the Queen. Uh, yeah, but uh, absolutely committed. Uh, it is true that there were many people in 75 who voted against, who have changed their minds in the ensuing 41 years. Uh, that, that is true, and that may well include Jeremy. It also includes people like uh, John Prescott and uh, Doug Hoyle and many others. So that's not unusual, but we're committed to staying in. To us, there is no progressive argument for Britain leaving the European Union. There's no progressive argument about Greece. Greece... Greece don't even want to leave the Eurozone, never mind Europe. And how can it be progressive to leave the rest of Europe dealing with this so-called trade agreement with America, TTIP? We just walk away from it, leave it to them, and then we end up with a trade deal that's very heavily influenced by whatever comes out of it, except, of course, that the current government might put things in that the European Parliament and others okay. managed to take out. So we'd have a Nick, worse agreement with America. How did America. you feel about being at the heart of that media storm? Annoyed that someone leaked details of a conversation you'd oh, had? The, the whole thing is A-grade, 24-carat bilge. I mean, it, it's just... Did it's just nonsense. It's, not, it's just, I mean, honestly, the idea that I would deliver a sermon to Her Majesty the Queen, or still more improbably, that she would lower herself to have a bust up, as the son put it, with a mere sort of politician like me, it's just ludicrous. They'll no doubt, by the way, say that that was a non-denial denial. denial. Uh, which is what they said when I last told them it was nonsense. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just okay. ridiculous. I think we shouldn't be dragging the Queen into it. And whoever, whoever peddled, whoever peddled this silly false story to the Sun, who then gullibly gobbled it up, should stop trying to drag her into it. She doesn't want to be involved in it, and I think we should respect that. Okay. Either of you want to comment on that before I bring in a question? No? Well, I just want to know one thing, Alan. I'll tell you what's progressive about leaving the European Union. We will get away from having our laws made by people we can't vote for and remove, and return to being a democratic nation. And that is progressive. Mm. That right. is progressive. Yes. And it's something young people should embrace. OK, I'm going to bring in another question about the issue of youth. And I think our volunteer, Paige, is going to read it. It was from Finian Robinson. Paige. 
As a 17-year-old who will live with the consequences of this crucial EU referendum far longer than those on the stage, I am outraged <laughs> and offended that we, aged 16 and 17, will not be allowed to vote on this issue, which will have such a significant effect on our futures. How is this justifiable, and how will you each ensure that the concerns of young people are addressed in the in and out campaigns? Where okay. Is she? Where is she? She's at the back. Oh, there. I see. Sorry. I'd but like she's our volunteer, Andrea. Oh, I see. Right. It's an interesting question. I'm actually very much on the fence about this. I think um, the, the only thing I draw from is I had a debate at one of my secondary schools um, a couple of years ago now where they wanted to discuss as a youth parliament um, whether the age of voting should be lowered to 16. And there were about 140 of them there. We turned it into a parliament. We had a speaker, all that. In the end, they voted by something like 120 to about 7 that they shouldn't um, lower the voting age. And the reason they gave was because when you're 16, 17, you're still much too influenced by your immediate family around you. Whereas once you reach 18, your views are more independent. I mean, that's the only thing I can offer to this, but I, I actually feel quite, um, you know, quite divided on the subject. And my children are 20, 17, and 12, so they're right in that zone. And certainly, okay. I think my own kids would well Alan? certainly be up to voting. Well, we tried to amend the legislation to get, I think, Lib Dems as well, to try to get 16 and 17 year olds voting in this because it was a vote about the future, just like the referendum in Scotland last year. We failed. My worry is how, so, you know, that, that argument's gone. How do we ensure that we get 18-year-olds and above voting when the voter registration system has missed so many off? So there's a big job to do in universities, in colleges, to get young people to register. And I think just going back to something that Nick said earlier, you know, in Ireland they had this wonderful referendum on gay marriage, which in a socially conservative country had an amazing two-to-one to, -one to uh, vote in favour. And they had an issue there. They had a different demographic. Younger people felt that gay marriage was right. Older people felt it was wrong. And they had this thing, tell your granny where young people went and convinced the older generation why it was important to them. So I actually think there's a better, I'm not suggesting this, but there's a better argument for 60, 70 year olds not having the vote and 16 and 17 year olds getting it. Okay, Nick? Uh, I mean, I, I, I haven't got much to add because I, I, I've always been an advocate of um, lowering the, the voting age. And I think anyone who was concerned that it, that, you know, that it didn't work or was inappropriate or whatever, just look at the commitment of those 16 and 17 year olds who got really stuck into the debate in Scotland. I actually think it enriched that referendum debate. I don't think it weakened it. And um, I'm not, I'm, I don't buy this idea that you're kind of, I mean, you didn't say infantile, but you're sort of too dependent on other people's views when you're 16 or 17, and then suddenly sort of chrysalis-like, you emerge 18 with your mind completely made up. It's not the way I okay. sort of grew up. And I just think I know lots of 50-year-olds who still can't make up their minds and lots of 14-year-olds right. who, who know their own mind very well. Well, I've always Three, taken yeah. the view that to be a candidate, uh, to, be a, to vote in an election, you should be able to be a candidate in an election, and we will, after this referendum, have a proper debate about whether 16 and 17 year olds get the vote. They won't this time around. But an interesting observation, whether it's Greece, whether it's Spain, whether it's France, uh, whether it's Italy, right across the continent, on the center right and left, the new Eurosceptic tide is utterly dominated by the under 30s. I don't think we're quite there yet in this country, but it's an interesting observation. The rebellion against Brussels is coming from the young. Okay, can I ask a question starting with you, Nigel? We're seeing some pretty terrible scenes at the moment with the refugee crisis that's taking place in Greece and in other countries at the edge of Europe, even in Calais. Um, people would say that the pictures we're seeing, this is a story which is really something very, very human. And really, these are asylum seekers rather than economic migrants. Are you scaremongering about the refugee crisis? Well, look, I mean, you know, when the boss of... Uh, Nick quoted the boss of Europol... Um, earlier on in this debate, the boss of Europol said two weeks ago there are now three to 5,000 jihadi terrorists, in his view, on mainland Europe who've used the migrant routes to get into Europe. And that is the problem that there are. Yes, there is a huge tide of human misery. I understand that. But the problem that we've got is we have absolutely no means of defining who a genuine refugee is. We, we cannot continue, or Europe cannot continue, 
with its current policy. It has led to scenes such as that we saw in Cologne, some of the things that are happening now socially in Sweden that are wholly unacceptable. To have a proper refugee policy, we will need, the EU will need to have offshore processing centres where they can define who is genuinely a refugee as opposed to somebody just displaced by war. Because if you believe the UN, there are currently 59 million people displaced by war. The, the, what Angela Merkel did last year to say, as many of you that want to come, we can cope, was, I think, one of the biggest policy areas of modern politics. Andrea, do, do you agree with Nigel? And also, there's an amendment in the Lords at the moment calling for Britain to take 3,000 unaccompanied children from Calais. Do you agree with that? Well, I think it's absolutely devastating. And I think on the ground, you know, I think people are doing amazing work just to try and look after whether they are refugees, asylum seekers, migrants. Um, they're still human beings and they absolutely do need help. And I'm glad to see that Europe is now actually starting to pick that up. I mean, obviously, I do agree with Nigel that Angela Merkel's decision to say, well, come along in, was devastating because what it did was encourage people to make what is a perilous journey. It also encouraged human traffickers and all of the perils of that, which has just exacerbated the problem. But so what I about think what, unaccompanied um, children? Sorry? What about unaccompanied children? That's so a different on, on issue. That, on that very specific point, David Cameron has been very clear that there, there, there's a very careful consideration here between whether you simply take those children from everything they're familiar with and bring them to the UK where they don't have the language, they don't have any family and so on. And he's taking advice from some of the children's charities on what is the best thing to do. So obviously, if you have a child who's orphaned and there is extended family around, it's better if you can keep them with their extended family. So I think the Prime Minister has been very clear that he's looking very carefully at what is the best thing to do for those children. And I'm absolutely certain that if the best thing is to bring them to this country, then he will. OK, Nick? No, I, I'm, I am... Um... I'm hugely embarrassed by the very meagre response of this government to the unaccompanied children. I, there's, there is simply no, there is so, no earth, there is no earthly reason why we couldn't respond to the target that Save the Children other campaigners have set to take in these you know, lonely, traumatised children who are not the gun-toting terrorists that Nigel talked These are children, and what, unaccompanied and children. And what does that mean for the EU debate? Can, can I just, yeah, on the EU debate, exactly. What I think is so deeply disingenuous uh, about the way in which uh, Nigel and others try to use people's legitimate unease and fear and disquiet about what they see on their television screens about these millions of wretched, frightened people risking their lives coming into Europe and somehow claiming that if we leave the European Union, uh, all will be, be well, is that it's based on a totally totally false assumption that if we leave the European Union, people won't continue to flee war and attrition and hunger and poverty and persecution and try and come to the United Kingdom. Whether we're in the European Union or not, of course people will flee huge distances to try and come here. And it is so dishonest to somehow claim that if we were to leave the European Union, somehow that problem would go away. It's deeply, deeply can I, dishonest. Alan, can I... <laughs> Can I come back in? After Alan. I think, we sh I think we should be playing our role in Europe. Now, we're in the almost perfect position of being outside Schengen, but part of the Dublin Accord. So every year, about a 1,000 asylum seekers who come to this country are returned because they're economic migrants and not asylum seekers. If we leave the European Union, we lose that. And, I repeat, it is inconceivable that there will be sufficient goodwill in France. The mayor of Calais comes to Parliament once every three months and says, ironically, Nigel's catchphrase, take back your border. They want us to take back the British border from, uh, from Calais back to Dover. That would mean we'd be in a worse situation. What we should be doing is playing our part in resolving what is the biggest problem that Europe, refugee crisis that Europe has faced. And it's our problem as well. And it's the United Nations problem. Let's pull out of the UN if we want to blame somebody for all of this. Or let's work together with the UN and with Europe to solve this problem and play our part by taking those unaccompanied children who have families in this country and which are, who are Alan. desperate in terms of their need for uh, talked, for um, family life. You've and talked who about are, the border at Calais. about 90, okay. as I understand Can I just ask you quickly, you have you, you've, you've just talked about that border at Calais, and obviously President Hollande has 
um, warned that that might be pushed back if we were to leave the EU. Why would France rip up a treaty between the two of us that has nothing to do with the EU? Well, it has a lot to do with the EU, actually. Yeah. It has everything to do with the EU. Yes, it does, Nigel. The fact that we are both European Union countries was the... And listen to David Blunkett, who negotiated the agreement with Nicolas Sarkozy when he was the Interior Minister of France. It was because we were members of the European Union that that deal was done. It's a very unpopular deal for politicians in France. They've got a presidential election coming up. Britain wrenches itself away after 41 years of membership. Do you honestly believe there's going to be sufficient goodwill there to keep that agreement? Yes. Which basically is and UK yeah. border well, force, it, it not in France Dover, but well in Calais. Calais. But if we have yeah. a border force in Dover, Alan, we can say to people, no, you can't come in. That's what border oh, controls right. are. This scare story. This yes, scare, scare story, story that once yeah. they got into Britain, they set up a camp in Folkestone. Oh, no, they wouldn't. They disperse across the United oh, Kingdom well, right, before then. you could say Jack Robinson. Andrea? It's a ridiculous scare story. Please. Andrea. Yeah, no, well, I, I agree with Nigel. It's just a scare story. I mean, that, that agreement has nothing to do with the EU. And actually, interestingly, when Francois Hollande decided to tentatively suggest it might be torn up, the interior minister absolutely didn't. And so I think you have to be very careful here that you're not just peddling something that's just I'm repeating what nonsense. your Prime Minister said, the leader of your party, who said that if we leave the European Union, it's highly likely that France will say, take back your border. I agree with him. All right, listen, what we're going to do, because we're about to run out of time, I'm going to give you a little bit of what's been going on, on Twitter after this. But before we do this, I'm just going to give you all 30 seconds each, just to, one last chance to try and convince them. All right, Nick, off you go. I just think in this uncertain, footloose, fancy-free world, we are stronger together. We are stronger together. I think we make, we make ourselves safer, and I think we create and safeguard jobs for the future as well. So if we want to be a stronger nation in an uncertain world, I think it's important that we stick together with our European partners. All right. Hi. Alan? I'm Actually, I'm hold that thought. Nigel? <laughs> Well, we've heard tonight from Nick the audition to be the United Kingdom's next commissioner in Brussels. And indeed, indeed, through this campaign, we will hear Goldman Sachs and Nick Clegg and big businesses telling us it's vital to be part of this union for economic reasons. It isn't. We live in a modern global economy, and the sensible, rational thing for us to do is to take back control of our lives, take back control of our borders, and re-engage with the rest of the world as a happy self-confident nation that can do a damn sight better making its own rules. Alan. I think, I think in an even more interdependent world than it was in 1975, for us to rip up excellent trade agreements and then spend years trying to renegotiate them, for us to leave the protection of being part of Dublin but outside Schengen and then try to get some kind of control uh, of our borders that Nigel thinks we can do, even though the experience of other countries is they have to accept free movement. And to uh, tear up the European arrest warrant, which has been the single uh, biggest assistance to our police and security forces, because you can only right. have that if you're in the European <laughs> Union. That right. would be fantasy land. Good point. Andrea, thank you. OK, well, very briefly, I think the Remain side are all about Project Fear. And the Leave side is about Project Hope and about giving us the chance okay. in a big world to be a big player, All right. not a small player. OK, here's just a few comments from Twitter. Quite a lot of them seem to involve Nick Clegg. Look, I just really like Nick Clegg. This EU debate is quite punchy. Like I have to say, Nick Clegg is at his best. Um, I'll tell you the only thing that is deeply, deeply dishonest Clegg, you. All right, they're all about Nick Clegg. There's some support for the rest of them here too, but I'm afraid we are going to have to wrap up. How are you feeling about this? Another 100 days of this? Up for it? Let's see a quick show of hands. Has anybody been persuaded by what they've seen tonight to change their minds? There are a few people in here. It's all been worth it. And I have to say, it fits in the Palladium. Great theatre. I can imagine that they might make a play in the future about this EU referendum. I just want to know who's going to be playing Boris. I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight, but most of all, please, a huge round of applause for our panellists.